Okay, we're at the top of this hour. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to another ISTVS DES uh, seminar. Today we have with us um, a very special speaker. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our host for today, Dr. Bohemir Jelinek. He is a part of um, CAVS, Mississippi State University. Um, his expertise is in HPC software development. He works on simulations, um, off-road simulations, numerical methods, even discrete element method, and you know the lattice Boltzmann method. So we're going to learn probably more about this today. But he's perfect for us to host the event. So um, welcome to our chair, Dr. Bomer Jelinek. Over to you. Thank you. Warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for attending our ISTVS digital event today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to introduce Professor Dan Negrut. I first met Dan at the Machine Ground Interaction Consortium, or MAGIC, meeting at the University of Wisconsin Madison in September 2019. Dan Negrut organizes the MAGIC meeting every year for current and potential users of Chrono. To, to present their work, gain hands-on experience, and socialize. I attended multiple times. Dan is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is a head of the simulation-based engineering lab and NVIDIA CUDA fellow. Dan received his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Iowa. Among his many accomplishments, I will bring to your attention that he was a software developer for mechanical dynamics at the Adams Solver Group in Michigan. He served as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical, in, in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Michigan, and he was a visiting scientist at Argo National Laboratory. In 2005, then Negru joined the mechanical engineering faculty at the University of Wisconsin Madison and received a National Science Foundation Career Award in 2009. His scientific interests are in computational science. He established, along with Radu Serban, the simulation-based engineering lab, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, NASA, U.S. Army Research Office, Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, and several industry partners. His research projects focus on simulation in robotics, terra mechanics, high-performance computing, multi-body computational dynamics, fluid-solid interaction, computer vision, and computer graphics. Dan Negrut is one of the technical leaders of Project Chrono, an open-source multi-physics simulation platform. Chrono is used in real-life projects such as NASA Viper Design and the Artemis mission. Then, welcome. Let's all hear about your work on Terra Mechanics models for lunar robotics applications. Okay, well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, but we need, thanks for the introduction. And Varsha, thank you for hosting this series. Um, is this what you're seeing on the screen right now? Let me see. Can I? Yes. Because I shared, I shared in full screen for some reason. Let, let me let me try to do it again. Okay. Bear with me for one second. Is this better now? Yes, yes. Okay, good work, good to go here. Well, thanks thanks everybody for taking the time to, to be here for my presentation. I really appreciate it. I don't know what time zones you are on, uh, but in some cases I know it's either very late or very early, I appreciate that. I'm going to start by uh, giving credit where it's due. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful people I've been working with for many years now. I have here in the first row, according to the seniority, a bunch of undergrad students. There's a person who's from high school working in the lab with us. There's like a bunch of graduate students and some non-students. I'm one of them, and so is Radu, my, my, my colleague and one of the uh, leaders of the lab. And I also want to point out some collaborators from outside the lab. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today 
goes back to the work of Ken, who's a friend of mine from MIT, soon to be Berkeley, is moving there. And then on the Chrono side of things, um, I, I had the pleasure of working for now almost 14 years with Alessandro and his group at University of Parma, and then Rainer in Germany and uh, Bonaventura in Spain. They are helping uh, with various aspects of the software development. Um, also, I want to uh, give a shout out to a bunch of other people who are not, uh, whose pictures are not on the previous slides, but they work on the software in all sorts of capacities and help the lab. And here they are, and I'm very, very, very grateful for these individuals uh, as well. Um, finally, some funding sources, U.S. Army Research Office, NASA, we have two ongoing projects right now, and the presentation is going to be by and large tied to these, these projects. National Science Foundation uh, allows us to continue to develop Chrono and some uh, partners from uh, industry. Uh, now, in terms of like what I'm going to talk about today, uh, is going to be on an overview of what we do in the lab in the area of uh, terra mechanics. Um, and it's going to be breadth over depth. I'll have some equations because if I didn't show equations, I would have some sort of like identity crisis and such. So I figured like once in a while, I show some equations and then move on to other more interesting things from, uh, from there. So here's a starting point. Uh, we all need good quality data because we're based on data. Uh, we can reach wise decisions and based on data, if you have plots and graphs and movies and such, that data leads to insights uh, and, and, and wisdom. Um, data these days is extremely important. If you think about machine learning and AI, it, requ it requires tons and tons of data. And historically speaking, if you think about data, it comes kind of like from two sources. Uh, First and foremost, uh, it comes from live measurement and sensing. You have sensors on things and they move around or bridges and they stay and you know, collect data. You go out in the field and you do a field test and you collect data. So that's historically the most prevalent way of getting this data. But recently, the way I look at things, we can use simulation and generate synthetic data that hopefully resembles the real data. And with this data, you, you draw the same conclusions or gain the same insights, perhaps even better than you would with actual data. Uh, so when it comes to uh, simulation, um, this is what we do in the lab. Um, the name of the lab is simulation-based engineering lab. We try to the extent possible to come up with new algorithms, methods, models, and such to help people do a better job designing engineering systems. Um, now, simulation. People simulate stuff in the stock market, in chemistry, in you name it, a lot of modeling and simulation. We in the lab are interested in like field robotics and autonomous systems and, and ground vehicles by and large. Um, and everything that we do, as far as research is concerned, a lot of people get master's thesis and PhD thesis in, in the lab. Um, you know, these research outcomes, eventually they're funneled back into the code that we uh, uh, take care of here with Alessandro at uh, Parma. Um, and this code is called Pro Project Chrono. And there's like a lot of links here uh, about, you know, where it's available on GitHub. It's open source, it's released under BSD3 license. So anybody can use it and such. And super quickly, there's a bunch of uh, modules. Uh, there's like a core um, module, and then there's a module for interacting with CAT tools, such as, for instance, uh, SolidWorks for co simulation. For C sharp, if you want to in interface it to Unity, for instance, for distributed computing, for fluid soil interaction, discrete element method, for group visualization with Vulkan scene graph or ELICT, interfacing to MATLAB, uh, support for sparse linear algebra with MKL and MUMS, uh, an autonomous uh, research uh, toolkit uh, that provides uh, basic ROS to autonomy stacks, OpenGL interface, multi core support, post processing support. It has a Python interface, uh, simulates sensors, uh, simulates multiple vehicles at the same time, and it has a dedicated module, module that um, is uh, supposed to help people get going really fast with simulation of uh, vehicles, tracked and uh, wheeled. Um, this is a plot that shows the number of uh, users on the forum. These are like, at this point, close to 650 people who are part of the forum. It's not that we have that many users, we have way more than that, but these are people who 
are on the forum asking questions, sometimes providing answers and such. Um, this is the number of GitHub stars as of 2020. We have more than 2,000 now, but since 2020, I have to keep track of this because I have NSF funding and I have to report essentially each month how the software is doing from where this plots. Um, here is a super quick example of a simulation a Hammer off-road, in this case, rigid terrain. Um, and I said that I was going to show some equations. Here they are. Essentially, the code formulates the equation of motion. And I'm going to get the details here. But uh, the code then discretizes the equations of motion and solves them. And when it solves them, you can get all sorts of like uh, uh, interesting uh, simulations going if you take the time to set up the models. Um, here is like a fluid sort interaction uh, of a vehicle in a fording operation, which is the counterpart of the vehicle at the left. And finally, this is um, a demonstration of how Chrono is, is used at the National Advanced Driving Simulator, NADS. Uh, we deployed there uh, last year, and it's ongoing work with Chris Schwartz, a collaborator from there. And the idea is to use the sensor suite and their big simulator uh, to um, understand how humans interact with uh, autonomous vehicles. And just to put things in perspective, back in 2000, this was an $80 million investment. And the size of the simulator is basically two basketball courts. And I have this, I don't know if you can hear or see this. I hope that the, the movie comes through. But this is Jason, a lab student, driving inside the simulator. And this is what he sees. And this is how it moves in the, in the big uh, simulation, though. Uh, so I'm going to move on because the interest is not there for this talk is in Terra Mechanics. And there are like so many instances where Terra Mechanics comes into play. Uh, this is uh, a topic that is very relevant in my mind and is, hasn't got the attention that it deserves. But probably I'm preaching to the choir here. A long story short, today I'm going to mostly be interested in these sort of applications and how um, we're using Chrono in the lab and some other projects outside the lab um, to understand how uh, rovers move on deformable uh, terrain. So here's the starting point. And this is an interesting thing that we learned over a project that ended last year. So what, what essentially learned out of that project in a nutshell was that NASA was not testing the rovers, perhaps the way they should be tested. Uh, and this is, for instance, the curiosity testing of 2012. And I'm not going to basically go through all the details, but I'm going to just say this. They take the rover, which is 1,900, like 900 kilograms. And then what they do, they reduce from 1,900 pounds to have 750. Uh, given that on Mars, uh, you have essentially one ballpark, like one third, the gravity pool. So therefore, uh, they lighten the vehicle and then they go to the Mojave Desert, which is the picture here, and they test the rover with understanding that the, the, the way the rover is going to press on terrain is going to be just like on Mars, because there the gravitational pull is lower. Well, it turns out that if you go about, like, about it like that, then you would have to do the same thing with the granules of sand that make up the terrain. So you lighten the, the rover, which is great, but then if you do that, then you have to also lighten the granular material to keep, you know, to keep the same sort of like a, a, a ratio between them, because you cannot have a terrain that is pulled by a high gravitational pull and put in it a vehicle that is very light. Because if you do so, you're going to come up with conclusions that are overly optimistic. Uh, just if you if you think about it, when you have a lot of gravitational pull, the terrain has a better strength and it's going to support uh, and it's going to shear later in the game and you support the vehicle better, which is not going to happen on the on the, uh, on Mars or on the moon. So if, last month, I have a, I have a collaboration um, with Professor uh, uh, Whitaker, Red Whitaker at Carnegie Mellon and Heather and 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 uh, and Red, they, they send their rover in January to the moon. It blew up, unfortunately, because the astrobotic lander uh, blew up, uh, but they today they use they use this sort of like gravitational offset to test the rover, and the reason why I went there was more or less to tell him that he doesn't need to do that, 
uh, because a there are some scaling laws that I'm going to talk about later, and then also there is simulation. Uh, there are simulation results to back up the fact that if you go by like that, you're for all purposes misleading yourself and come up with uh, insights that are not true once the rover gets uh, on the moon. And perhaps that was, as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing that came out of that NASA project that uh, we finished last year. So let's talk about how we got to that conclusions and what sort of term mechanics support is available in Chrono. And I'm going to cover three models, uh, term mechanics models that are available in Chrono, SEM, which is semi-empirical, CRM, which is physics-based, and DEM, which is physics-based. So SEM soil contact model has a real-time factor somewhere between 0 0.5 and 50. And the real-time factor is the amount of time uh, that you have to spend in simulation to get one second the system dynamics. So if the RTF, let's say like CRM, it says it's 50 here, means that I have to wait in my simulator for 50 seconds, like to crunch up to crunch numbers and, and and you know do computations to get how the vehicle moves for one second. If you go to DM, the real time factor is can get as high as 14,000 in our uh, solver. And the idea is that the, the smaller the RTF, the better. And whenever, whenever it drops below one, it means that you are in real time. So in that case, if you care to, you can bring a human uh, in the loop. So we'll talk about all these three. And SEM is, is uh, it has a long history. Uh, the paper was published in 2009 by some folks from DLR, which is the analog of uh, of NASA in Germany. And it goes back to the seminal work of Becker Wong. Um, and the idea is just like in the Becker Wong approach that you have a terrain, uh, like a height map, and then you have a certain sinkage and that leads, that yields a, or produces a pressure that acts on the wheel at a certain point um, um, in the terrain. And then you sum up all these pressures and you come up with the normal force that um, in the end prevents the vehicle from sinking into the terrain. Now, there are some parameters that are associated with the Becker Wong and they need to be provided. And then you have the, the, the shear component and these are equations that are very well known, but the pressure that you just computed, you drop it in here to compute the, the max shear that, that goes into the formula to compute the shear and you have an accumulated shear uh, coefficient that shows up there. And uh, for that, once you apply this, you get another component, tangential component, and you integrate it over the surface of the wheel and you come up with the traction in the end, uh, accounting for the pressure and the tau, and basically you are good to go at that point. Now, the problem with this is that you need to do some uh, bevermeter tests. And on the moon, it's difficult to do something like this. Uh, this is bulky. It's a complicated procedure. It's not standardized. Um, and what, what happened in, in, in the community as far as these lunar uh, or like extraterrestrial studies were uh, concerned, uh, people didn't have a good understanding of what happened in low gravity because these tests were not conducted there with appropriate uh, uh, testing equipment. And this methodology being semi-empirical, it led people astray, at least in my, in my opinion. Um, so why, why, uh, why, why are there problems with SEM? So it's a semi-empirical approach and it's very, it's, it's very tailored to a specific scenario and by and large it was on earth. Uh, if it is to be used on the moon, uh, in theory, you'd have to go and do a bevermeter test. What people did, for instance, uh, the Chinese mission U2, to that rover, uh, it did an inverse problem. And as the rover was there, it came up with the uh, with the uh, SCM parameters. That, however, is a little bit too late because you want to have those parameters available when you design the rover to understand its behavior. Not that it's useless; it is important to have it because you keep talking with the rover uh, to uh, to direct the the mission. But ideally, you would like to have uh, this knowledge about how the vehicle behaves on the moon before it reaches the moon. So 
Lastly, there is no concept of mass and inertia. It's a force model, just like uh, in our basic dynamics class, when you have a spring mass damper uh, system, they never tell us anything about like, oh, by the way, the spring has a mass. Oh, and the damper has a mass too. No, it's just like a mass and there are some force elements and the spring magically, based on how much it deforms, it gives you a force and the same for velocity uh, when it comes, that, that comes into play for the damper, uh, damping element. So it's the same way for this model. If I want to dig into it, or if I want to uh, grade it, or if I want to uh, bulldoze the material, this is not going to, to do it. So you need something else. However, um, people like it a lot because it's SEM is, is fast. Uh, it can be faster than real time. This is used here to investigate the mobility over uh, uh, non-trivial terrain at low values of uh, Sleep. So if the sleep is low and if the wheel geometry is not fancy and if you don't have material ejection and such, then SEM will do the job. Um, here is how we use it. We use it a lot in uh, for reinforcement learning, in this case, for deformable uh, terrains. Um, and as, again, we use it because it's fast and it, got, it gives good results most of the time. Um, and I'm not going to insist on this, but when we design autonomy stacks and we need to look at the environment here, how it changes, basically we fall back whenever possible on uh, SEM. Um, so I'm going to now move on, talk about the physics-based uh, models in Chrono, and this is the continuous representation model CRM and the discrete element method uh, later on. So as I said, these are physics-based. So the starting point are some equations that speak to the conservation of mass here and momentum. But if you go about it like that, uh, you don't have enough equations for how many unknowns you have, because this is in the end uh, due to the incompressibility of the material constraint equation. And here the unknowns, you have U and sigma. So you have more unknowns uh, than, than equations. And sigma is the Cauchy stress tensor, and it's split into an isotropic pressure and a deviatory component of the stress tensor. And then if you have a simple problem, like let's say linear elasticity, you can quickly come up with a relationship between the strain and the stress and you're done. But here, when you look at soils in a continued representation uh, fashion, the problem becomes a little more complicated and you cannot have a simple uh, closure relation. Um, instead, uh, people, and this is not something that I invented, it's something that my collaborator, Ken Cameron, um, injected into the thermomechanics model, um, said like, okay, well, let's consider the time evolution of the Cauchy stress tensor. This is something that goes back uh, probably one and a half decades before Ken. Uh, but we brought them to bear in the context of uh, solidity particle hydrodynamics. And based on this equation, we got the closure relation that we needed. And I'm not going to get into the details, but long story short, the strain rate was, was tied uh, to the Cauchy uh, stress uh, tensor, its time derivative or its rate of change specifically. And we made a connection for the elastic regime or for the plastic regime. And I'm not going to get in details, but long story short, we had the equations and we used now the smooth particle dynamics method to spatially discretize them. And there's nothing fancy about this. Again, I didn't invent this. You can use material point method if you choose to do so. But then you discretize the, 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 the mass balance, the momentum balance, the rate of change of the Cauchy stress tensor, and you have your discretized, spatially discretized uh, equations of motion. You, you have to account for like uh, boundary conditions and coupling between fluid and solids. And we do so uh, by using what we call boundary condition inform enforcing particles, BCE particles. Uh, that couple the motion of the solid to that of the uh, granular material. And then what's left at that point, you have spatially, you have discretized spatially, but you have to discretize in time and you do so. And then you also uh, have to take care of the stress tensor because you have an elastic regime and you have a plastic regime and you have to um, suitably use the right equations to handle the expression of the stress. But once you do that, you can start running simulations in which you have coupling between like a solid phase and the continuum, which is the, the terrain here. And that's, if you pay attention to the name, it's a continuous representation model 
Um, essentially, we know that the terrain is discrete, but I don't care about how every single grain of sand moves. And I just want to uh, look at the continuous presentation. I homogenize the system. And therefore, I reduce the degree of freedom count and hopefully the, the simulation time. And here is another, another example of the Curiosity rover moving up a slope. And at some point, it gets here. This is where it start, it's going to start slipping right now. And this is something that is interesting and relevant because sometimes when you have high slippage, the vehicle can, the rover can dig itself in. And certainly, you want to avoid situations like what happened to the Spirit rover, which got stuck and uh, died a sudden death uh, on Mars. Um, here is another example. And I told you that, for instance, with Becker, you cannot dig and you cannot bulldoze and such. And this, the purpose of this simulation is to show that once you have CRM, you can start doing these sort of uh, uh, scenarios. And this is a project that we're working on right now. It has to do with uh, the Razor um, excavator. So if you take a step back and think about it, like if you have like a, like a pile of dirt that you want to uh, move, on Earth, the heavier the, the piece of equipment, the more the, the bigger the pile we can push, right? Because what matters is like the weight times some friction coefficient that that caps the amount of shear, the, the, the lateral force that you can impress on a pile. So in principle, you want to have really heavy equipment, but you cannot send it to the moon. Um, then not only that, you know, it's expensive to send something heavy there. When it gets there anyway, it's one sixth of its weight to start with. So people need different ways to dig into the material. Here is how this is done. It's done through drums and they rotate counterclockwise and they, they dig the material and then they, you rotate them counterclockwise or the other opposite, the other direction. And they, they, you empty the material, you move around, you dig somewhere, move around and you unload somewhere else. So this is something that the project that is going on in the lab and again it falls back on the crm method here's another example uh bulldozing on uh crm under earth gravity and the moon gravity and the question is like how is how are things changing when you go from earth gravity to to moon gravitational pull so also i want to show you something in terms of like uh, the real time factor so um we looked at all sorts of like we do this on the GPU, by the way, using GPU computing. So GT, like a long time ago, GTX 1080, 2080, Titan, Pascal, P100, Volta, V100, A100, M Ampere. Here you should have H100. I don't have those results, although we have access to the machine as of recently. But long story short, um, for this simulation right here, if the terrain is simulated using 0 0.5 million particles, the real time factor is 33. If you go to 50 million on a A100, the real time factor goes as high as 238. But probably for something as simple as this, if you, if you use a half million particles, it's already uh, good enough. Uh, just to give you an idea about like what sort of uh, real time factors you see for the CRM. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about why gravity offset is not needed and how the simulator uh, uh, shows that. And to that end, I first have to talk about what is called the uh, um, granular scaling laws. And this is a thing that was was came came into being probably like late 1940s, early 1950s and such. And they're like references to this like 1970s. And it lay kind of like dormant and was not paid attention. But now it's 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 becoming relevant again, I think. So um, here's the story, like preamble. OK. So take a look at this function. It's a function of three variables, A, B, and C. And this is the expression of the function. So now if you look at this function and you do f of 1, 2, 3, or f of 5, 10, 3, or f of 5, 5, 6, you'll notice that the value of the function is the same. So how come? It's pretty simple. If you divide by A, you observe that actually this function depends on B, C over A. That's it. So it's a function g of b c over a where g is this guy so as soon as i give you three three arguments a b c for which b times c over a is the same then f is going to be the same so take a look here b times c is two times three divided by one is six this is 10 times three is 30 divided by five is six this is five times six is 30 divided by five is six 
So all these functions are go, all all the the values of this function evaluated at all these different points um, are going to be the same because the special way I chose these these values these arguments. And if you want a really quick analogy, is the Reynolds number. Um, and this is how Boeing, for instance, tests their airplanes in the wind tunnel. They don't bring a 777 in the wind tunnel. They bring a replica. And essentially, they run experiments uh, in the wind tunnel, a uh, Reynolds number that is what the actual plane would experience in steady state conditions when it flies up there in the sky in the big plane. And then they can scale the forces. Um, and they don't bother to run big tests. They run tests in the in the tunnel and it's the same thing with the granular scaling laws so here you have a function before it was of three arguments now it's of more arguments one two three four five but as long as you have on granular material experiments like let's say a small vehicle or in a big vehicle if these these numbers are the same then then you can say something about the relationship uh, for instance, in our case, between the power to move the rover, the small rover, and the power to move the big rover, um, or the velocity at which the small rover uh, moves and the velocity at which the big rover moves, they are, they, are, they are related. You can figure that out as long as these numbers stay the same between the big rover and the lower rover, uh, uh, small rover, then you can you can infer. Uh, you can infer some conclusions about the power consumption between uh, of the big rover base of the small rover. Now, here we're not necessarily interested in big rover and small rover. We actually want to keep the same rover. What we're interested in is like the fact that the gravity changes. So I have to change certain things. For instance, if I want to keep this value constant and I want to have the same length of the vehicle, the, the, the wheel in, in this case, uh, I, I have to uh, change because the gravity is larger six times on on earth i have to uh, um, reduce when i look at the moon um, i have to start with the assumption that the moon the angular velocity should be uh, uh, square root of six times uh, smaller because i square it and i need to keep this uh, uh, this value constant and so do i with this and this is the slope at which i conduct the experiment and this is the gravitational pull on the moon and on Earth, respectively, and this is the uh, the, the uh, radius of the, the wheel, um, and this is a, a form factor, a shape factor, and basically, as I said, if I keep these numbers the same, then I can I can uh, make comments um, that relate that, that tell me, or I, I have insights that tell me how the power consumption uh, on Moon is going to look like, and how the velocity of the rover is going to look like on uh, on the Moon. So. In collaboration with uh, colleagues from from NASA, as I said, we worked for for uh, on a project uh, that ended last year. We did all sorts of like, uh, or they did, and we used the results of their experiments. It was like a single wheel test and uh, a, a, a rover, full rover test. And he's, here is the digital twin in Chrono, uh, or the single wheel test. And here is for the uh, full rover um, model, and. These are the tests that we ran. So we ran uh, simulations, and folks at NASA, they ran tests on GRC3 and GRC1. And for the single wheel, the wheel mass was 70.5 uh, kilograms. And this was the bulk density. This is the friction angle. Uh, and we took like three, three density, bulk densities, and three friction angles. And then uh, we had for GRC1 here, uh, we had uh, three bulk densities and three friction angles. And then we did the full rover, uh, some tests for GRC3 and GRC1. And the first thing that is striking, take a look at this. So the Viper rover, the mass is somewhere, uh, it, it changed over the design phase, but it started from like anywhere from like 450, 440, and went up to like 520, depending on what instrumentation you know they would add to it as time passed but this is this is a reflection of of the fact that people used uh gravitational offset they said like okay we're sending this to the moon it has uh 520 kilograms therefore 
when we test on Earth, let's divide it by six and you get more or less 88 kilograms. Or if early on, because the mass was lower, you would get 73 kilograms. So our point is that you don't need to do this. Uh, if you want to test and get good results, then just keep, is it 520 kilograms or 540 kilograms? Then keep it on Earth to be 540 because also the, that the same higher gravitational pull is going to pull the granular material that this this rover is going to work on so in retrospect this was not needed and you would have to work not with a, a replica a reduced mass replica of the rover you need to just work with the actual rover and you're in good shape so single wheel this is the schematic of it i'm not going to get into details here but uh it's just like a a, a chrono model and this is a test rig that is ready it's a template it's ready to be used uh, and this is the moon gravitational representative unit um grew three and gru three and this is what was used in the testing and here are the interesting results so uh, based on the scaling law i told you that you have to do a square root of six when it comes to angular velocity so we used on Earth in simulation 0 0.8 radian per second. And on the moon in simulation for different gravitational pool, we used 0 0.3. And here is single wheel, Earth versus moon. And this is full rover, Earth versus moon. Now, what should you look at? You should look whether the Earth with a certain fraction, uh, uh, friction angle and a certain bulk density do the results align with the results on the moon for the same friction angle and the same bulk density? So is, is blue like red? So take a look at blue like versus red, and this is slip versus geometric slope. So what do I mean by this? So imagine that you have a slope of, let's say, let's say 15 degrees slope. And then you say, I'm going to have on Earth I'm going to let the vehicle move up this slope with 0 0.8 radius per second. And I'm going to wait until it reaches steady state. I'm going to look at the velocity and I'm going to compute the slip. And I'm going to have for 15 degrees, which is probably this point here, I'm going to have this slip. I'm going to start, slope is 15 degrees. My angular velocity is 0 0.8. Therefore, I noted that for that value, the slip was this. Then on the moon, I'm going to have a lower gravitation pull. I'm going to have a lower angular velocity. I'm going to put it on a 15 degree slope and I'm going to see what slip I, I note on the moon. And lo and behold, you, you note the same slip on the moon. And if you look here, a very, on Earth for various friction angles and bulk densities, and then you go to the moon, the, the curves overlap. Like look at green and brown, green and brown. And then this, this was for single wheel. And this is you go like full rover is the same. This is like, like a, a low friction angle, low density. You go up, you see again that earth and moon overlap. And by the way, what you have here, these dark points are experimental data from the, from the lab. Here, it says track nominal test on GRC3. Um, and then moving on, but, okay, let me explain this plot. So this is how the orange line on Earth, like this line, orange here, and how the purple line on moon were obtained. So we took like zero degree slope, five degree, 10 degree, 15 degree, 20 degree, 25, 30 degree. And then we, we stuck with 0 0.8 radians per second on, on Earth, and we look at what velocity was steady state divided by omega, uh, r one minus then quantity gives us the slip and you draw a point like for instance 15 15 would be this point and this is orange so it would be the orange point corresponding to 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 this so it's going to be like 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 that so that's that's a point and that's the point on moon and so on and this was done for the it says here full rover but then you have the same for for the single wheel and you get you know this this plot so long story short i think i said some point we ran about 250 252 simulations to get a plot like 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 this um and moving on uh then what we did the question was 
should you run full rover simulations or can you run a wheel, single wheel, because it's cheaper to run a single wheel. And we looked at that and we look on Earth and we look on the moon. And again, we paid attention to the granular scanning law. And in the end, it turned out that it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's OK if you run a single wheel because you learn from the single wheel how the rover is going to behave. Look, here is like on Earth, full rover versus wheel. And this is like how they overlap. This is how they overlap. You go on the moon, this is how they overlap single wheel versus full rover. This is how they overlap for different friction angle and different bulk density. Then we also went on uh, on the moon. We said, what happens if I change the angular velocity from 0 0.8 radians per second to 0 0.33? So this is moon. This is this slide doesn't have to do anything with Earth. And it turns out that by and large, this, this plot of geometric slope versus slip doesn't change. What changes is the velocity with which you climb up the hill. But if you plot this slip versus geometric slope, you get basically an overlap of the, of the results should you run the experiment at 0 0.8 radians per second or 0 0.33 radians per second. So then we moved on and we looked on, on, on GRC3, we looked at power usage. And if you remember, power usage was like, there's a term at the scale. This is power scaled by mg times square root of L times G. And if you run on the moon with 0 0.33 radians per second and on Earth with 0 0.8 radians per second, and we're talking about single wheel here, then again, the moon and Earth overlap. And as you, you can see them, how they overlap here. If you do not scale and you say like, I'm going to have on moon 0 0.8 radians per second and on earth 0 0.8 radians per second, you have this gap between the results. So if you scale according to the scaling law, then the results collapse on each other and you can start understanding with earth experiments how, how the behavior is going to look like on the moon. And this is for full rover, again, power usage, if you, apply the 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 grammar scaling law you the the solver the simulator tells you that the results collapse uh well if you don't obey the scaling law the you have this gap in in results and probably this is the most important slide um and here's what this slide says as i said in the beginning do not do not take a light rover on earth and test it in the mojave desert because it's not going to behave like the heavy rover when you send it to the moon. So here is, we, we said like, okay, let's do just that. Let's take the MGRU-3 at 73 kilograms, and let's take the Viper, which is 440 kilograms, basically kind of like six times that. And then let's move them, both of them at 0 0.8 rates per second. And if you do this geometric slope versus slip, this is what you see on the moon, and this is what you see on Earth. And, and take a look at the, the one that is interesting is the green one. Do you see it stops here? So what does that mean? So it, it, it means that you run the light vehicle. It's a light vehicle. You run it on Earth at a friction angle of 47.8 and a bulk density this much, and you go like 30 degrees, move up of a, of a slope at 30 degrees. And it tells you, okay, to move up on Earth, if you have 73 kilograms, then the slip that you'll experience is going to be 0 0.4 because, because of the strength that the gravitational pull impresses upon the, the, the sand in the, 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 the Mojave Desert. Well, if you, if you go on the moon and you, you basically have the same conditions, 47.8 and 18.39, then all of a sudden, this is where you are to a, to a to climb a 30 degree slope, you are going to have an 80.0 point or an 82% uh, slip. Just give me one second. Give me one second. Okay, sorry for that. Moving on. Anyway, this is basically, I think, as far as I'm concerned, probably the most relevant result that that we got in that in that project um okay and everything that i did here was for grc3 
And there are the same results over and over again for GRC1. I'm going to skip them because in the interest of time, oh my God, I'm all behind. So I'm the same results for GRC1, uh, I'm going to skip. So anyway, the, the, the long story short, no need for gravity offset. If you want to understand the speed of the rover and power draw on the moon, uh, then for steady state, it's good to just use the scaling laws. If you're interested in transients and if you want to see what happens to the terrain, because the scaling laws don't tell you how the terrain is turned, then you should basically, the CRM solver will take care of uh, business. So now uh, moving on super quickly, this was CRM. I'm going to move over to DEL. Uh, this is a simulation uh, with uh, 4 million, 4.7 million uh, elements in the set, in the terrain. And this needs 14 million spheres and the real time factor was 14,000. So it was very slow. Um, and I'm not going to get into details, but probably I'm almost sure that everybody knows what the discrete element method is. Um, and you have some pretty straightforward equations of motion, translational, angular uh, um, momentum um, equations. And you have a friction force in between bodies. You have a normal force and you have uh, a, a rolling uh, resistance moment. And there are some, it's some expressions for these forces that I have not invented, but I'm just using here for the uh, tangential component as well. And you have to cap it, um, uh, the friction force to be less than or equal to mu times the normal force. Um, and you have non-trivial geometries uh, for these particles. In our case, in chrono, we have like unions of spheres that are clamped together to give you non-trivial, non-trivial, uh, non-trivially shaped uh, bodies, and we use two GPUs, and the user can define his or her uh, contact force, and we emphasize simulation speed a lot. We do just-in-time compilation because our code is open source, and you can do that. And by by a rule of thumb, it's like it, it takes one hour simulation time for one second of dynamics for one million complex shaped particles. That's that's how fast it moves. Again, this is the um, um, GRU uh, rover, and we we looked at GRC terrain, but for GRC1, um, the size of the particle drops to 70, 80 uh, micron. We could not do that, but we kept the, uh, okay, so my time is almost up here. I'm going to speed up a little bit. We could not keep the we could not go that low it's it's too many too many particles it was in the billions so what we did we maintain a statistical distribution that you see in the grc1 terrain but we uh essentially multiplied all the particle sizes by a factor of 20. now if you ask me why 20 the answer is going to be because that's how small we could go and not to overwhelm the solver so it has the same the size distribution except that is the particle size is 20 times larger. So we didn't have like 80 micron, we had like 80 micron times 20 as our smallest particle. But long story short, this is the simulation. This is a 20 degree incline and the gravity therefore kind of pulls that way a little bit um, and the vehicle just moves up. And this is the experimental data. This is the data produced by the, the solver and um, this was single wheel or the full rover. Again, in DM, it tells you that you don't have to worry too much if you run single wheel test is, is good enough. And then what we did, we took a wheel and we said like, okay, well, let's run it over granular terrain. And we said like, can we optimize its behavior? Can we run an optimization loop to, to optimize the climbing ability of the wheel um, as far as energy efficiency is concerned? So I want to climb and I want to spend as little energy as possible. Also, I want to be able to steer the vehicle easily. So what we did, we took a wheel and we parameterized it uh, through eight variables, such as grouser wave amplitude. So it's like, is the amplitude like this of the grouser or is the amplitude like, like, like this? Uh, grouser wave number. Do you have something that barely changes or do you have like in the grouser is like the shape is like, like this, so like you'd be like, like, like this or it would be straight. Then the control point deviation, essentially it's saying like, do you have a, a, a convex wheel? This would be a convex wheel. This is top view, okay? Or do you have a concave wheel like this? Top view, okay? Or then the grouser height, the grouser thickness, the number of grousers, the wheel radius and the wheel width. And basically what we did 
we ran 4,209 simulations over a period of four months uh, on, 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 on our uh, computer computers here in the lab. And here's some samples. So mind you, they're like 4,029. I'm not going to show all of them, but these are examples. Like, you know, here it is, like here it is another one, or this, or this. Uh, and in the end, um, I don't know if I, I, you can see this, but essentially this is the optimal design. We 3D printed it. And it's just like a part because we cannot 3D print a big, big, big wheel. But you can assemble some of this, and that's what we plan to do. We can assemble them and get a, a wheel on a rover that we're working on here. So long story short, here, if you look, there are 4,029 points uh, because that's how many simulations we ran. And then we have the dependency of the energy efficiency on the wave amplitude, wave number, uh, convex versus concave, height, thickness, number of browsers. So this is for efficiency and uh, energy efficiency, and this is for steering. Um, so in the end, you what the student did, uh, he he fitted a Gaussian process and essentially was able to tell you, given any set of eight parameters, what the efficiency of the wheel is going to be and how easy it's going to be to steer uh, the wheel. And, and then if you have this response surface, then it's very easy to use an optimization uh, um, loop um, because you have gradients and you can do gradient descent and, and, and such. Now, here is the how the DM solver obeys the granular scaling law. So remember, we have we have 4,029 points. I can easily, I have a response surface. I can start generating outputs very easily and I can check is this solver obeying the gravitational scaling laws. And here is like, if you look here, this is the length, the radius of the wheel 0 0.34, this is 0 0.51. Uh, and you know, this is an omega and this is another omega angular velocity and so on. So look how close the results come when it, when it when you're looking at if the if the two different designs obey the scaling law. This is a little bit not so cute, but still pretty close. But in some cases, they almost collapse on top of each other, which tells you that that the solver uh, obeys the granular scaling laws. Now, the question is like, how come this was possible to run DM simulations for 4,029? Uh, test cases, the solver is like really fast. And here is, we didn't do this validation. Somebody from DOE did, we didn't have any business with this, was published in November of last year. They're looking at pebble bed nuclear reactors um, and they run some experiments and they run some simulations and they use the code lamps and they use 432 CPU cores and it took 66 hours for 420,000 pebbles. In Chrono, it took 15 minutes. And then star CCM plus uh, on 160 cores, it took 167 hours. In Chrono on a laptop, um, it took 27 minutes. So the solver is, is, is very fast. So what's the, the, the bottom line here? Probably the most interesting thing, um, at least as far as I'm concerned, in Chrono, when we worked on this project, the conclusion was that you don't have to, to do something like this. And actually that was the reason why I saw, I went to, to, to see Red at Carnegie Mellon. We have a project together and uh, an NSF project together. And essentially it was to talk with him and uh, just pick his brains about, about it. Uh, closing thoughts and disclaimers. This was, this sounds probably like super quick, cute. And you know, this is amazing, but I have to say something. Chrono is not a commercial code. It's a free research code. And as such, being a research code, and nobody pays us a dime other than NSF and such, everybody can use it for free. It has some rough edges. We're not into interfaces, and you know, we help the user as much as we can, and we have a Python interface and such. But you know, setting up a simulation experiment, and I talk now beyond Chrono, just to set expectations right. Whatever solver you take, to get to the point where you trust the results and you know what you're doing, it takes a lot of time, probably as much time as to set up a real experiment. However, however, if you if you buy the bullet and you spend the time and you get the model that is predictive, then you can run tons of simulations because cloud computing is your friend. And to run 400,009 DM experiments, that's that's possible. To run 400, 
4,209 experiments, that's hard. So that's where the, the return on investment is. Uh, so three highlights at the end of the day, physics-based simulation has been coming of age because there are good methods, uh, SPH-based, NPM-based, and amazing compute speeds. Uh, there's a Blackwell generation of GPUs coming up at the end of the year, next early next year will be even better. And I think it's the dawn, in, dawn of an era in term mechanics because of the compute power that we, we have. Uh, you know, SPH had been around, and NPM, they had been around since like, you know, more than two decades. But I think now they become relevant because there's a lot of compute power that you can throw at them. And then lastly, uh, term mechanics tests for extra, extraterrestrial missions need no gravitational offset. Just use physics-based simulation if you are interested in transients. Otherwise, you know, scaling laws sometimes are good enough. Uh, this is a picture. I told you that uh, we worked on this Viper project. It was like two weeks ago, NASA Johnson. And this is, this is the Viper. And it's supposed to go to the moon in, if everything goes as planned, which is always tough, uh, in seven months or so in November. Um, and with that, I went a little bit overboard here, but I hope that we still have some time for questions and hopefully answers too. So thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate you being here and listening to my, my presentation. Thank you, Dan. I'm sure everyone learned something from something new from your talk today. And if not, I am being told that this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube by the end of today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm opening the floor for questions and discussion. I would like to encourage you to type your questions in the chat or please indicate to Varsha that you are prepared. Let me see if there are I have a, I have a few remarks, if I may. Yes, great. Thank you. Yeah, let's right to here. Um, Dan, uh, great. I wasn't aware that your team is actually working on uh, the scaling question and let's say the scaling for uh, effect of gravity on the soil properties. So that, let, me, let, let me say something. To know. Mm -hmm. Ken Cameron is, so we have a project which actually is finishing this year he's the he's the force behind the gravity scaling loss he those that equation that i showed is not something they came up with he did and we were sure, part sure. of the team no, no i mean i was saying you, you and your team and of yeah. course your co-workers um no that's fantastic to know and actually um to make you aware um about a year a year and a half ago we had a des event uh of this type with uh, adriana daca mm -hmm. presenting mm -hmm. at that time she was with concordia university mm -hmm. in uh, canada and mm -hmm. she also was working on granular scaling laws uh you may have met her uh i did for, for i did her work yeah mm -hmm. and um right now i'm personally interested in the viper mobility results that that you have been uh, generated in um, generating in your project for NASA. Are there any publications already available um, that would describe yeah. uh, in more detail so what you were showing? I, I want to believe that in four weeks, we want to give it a shot, submit to science robotics. So the, the manuscript is like done 95%. So probably in like four weeks, the manuscript is going to, we'll probably drop it on archive uh when we submit it but that's that's where we are like it's it's imminent we're 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 working on it and people are 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 basically checking the checking the the the, the paper right now but hopefully okay. in four weeks there will be a paper on this perfect and all right then let's say my my final remark uh would be that okay your your principal conclusion that it's not necessary to scale the weight of uh the test rover for uh, mobility testing at earth gravity um that that's also supported by uh, there is a paper by uh one the joe one of course mm -hmm. um that was published in the journal of terra mechanics in 2012 mm -hmm. where he's coming to the same conclusion so it's basically um, in that paper, he's looking at a test results, mobility test data 
uh, from different sizes of uh, lunar and planetary rovers um, with weight offloading, without weight offloading. He was coming to the same conclusion, by the way. I'm just going to point you to that. Good. Awesome. I was not aware of that. I'll go and, and do my homework. Please there. have a read. Yeah. It was 2012. So Wong. Um, yeah. W O N G. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. The yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe Wong. Uh, he. Of course, let's say one of the the greats in Terra mechanics. Oh, uh, like so Becker Wong, you mean? Yes. Oh, oh, is this the Wong. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know, I know that paper actually. I know, is it a paper in which uh, they modify the 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 Becker Wong model to account for gravitational? No, I mean Joe Wong in that paper was just looking at avail at available test data. Um, right. And discussing them, so I'm just recounting mm -hmm. here from, from memory, mm -hmm. from my memory, because I've also been working on the subject mm -hmm. uh, on it all. So that that paper was very important. Um, no, please have a look. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, Joe Wong, he also um, was ISTVS president um, about mm -hmm. 20 years ago, and he's of course one of the greats in Terra Mechanics, and he's still around, still active. Um, yeah, no, I was just, I was just thinking of that that paper which um, supports also the conclusions that you have derived um, just now. Okay, great. No, that was all I was going to address. Oh, uh, maybe one additional remark on the scaled soils. <laughs> Sorry, but this this is a subject that's close to um, close to me on the I mean the the scaling laws. I've once. Um, seen actual scaled soil for lunar rover application and that was that was in fact in a lab in china uh there was a particular test that the chinese had run in support of the u2 lunar rover development for the original u2 rover more than 10 years ago and in that test lab they were running single wheel tests using a scaled soil so where the density of the particles was reduced according to the granular scaling laws so that was uh one type of test that they that they were running um but it was never published mm. but I, I i've seen it with my own eyes um, and i think long time ago in the uh, soviet union era uh during the lunokot lunar rover uh program uh, more than 50 years ago the soviets also were working on scaling laws as part of the lunar cot uh, mobility verification uh, on earth plus they did this parabolic flight thing with single wheel testing that was later also done in canada uh in in japan Okay. Well, thanks for the talk yeah. then. Uh, yeah, uh, let's be further in touch. Uh, in the Definitely. I just want to point out that uh, and, uh, to make clear what I'm, what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. So I, I'm a simulation guy. I'm not, uh, uh, I, I, I have all the respect for uh, the work of these individuals that you, you mentioned. Uh, it's not that I brought to bear the scaling laws. I'm just, I, I wanted to highlight the fact that the simulator that we put together in the lab happens to be obeying the the scaling laws. And in simulation, that's right. what we noted that uh, right. indeed you don't need to to uh, change the, the the vehicle, the mass of the vehicle. And mind you, this is like uh, you can just Google it. NASA is doing it in 2024. Uh, the rover that uh, that uh, Red put together at uh, Carnegie Mellon, the testing in 2024 is done with with gravity offset. So uh, that's that's something that you know they have to 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 kind of like come to terms with. And it's not it's, it's above my pay grade. Um, I think all that I'm saying at the end of the day is that the CRM method and the DM method. Um, they are they are very powerful um, and they capture you can see this in simulation the fact that you don't have to do any gravitational offset at the end of the day so that's that's the moral of the story as far as i'm concerned i'm concerned and again uh i just want to 
pay my respect to the work of the predecessors. First and foremost, my colleague, Ken Cameron, and then Adriana, she's done, and, and Chris, uh, it's just like an outstanding job. I'm not familiar with what the people working on the project in China have done, but I'm sure that they are smart people and they've done <laughs> amazing things. They put the rover on the moon and it moved for a long period of time. Uh, that was very, very unique. So I, I leave it there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Dan. Yeah, yeah. All right. Paul, Mia, back to you. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. And uh, we certainly don't want to have uh, surprises when we bring rover to the moon or do inappropriate testing of, of these machines. Uh, my question is more back to Earth. Uh, I see a lot of bulk density, uh, friction angle. I was wondering about cohesion. Do these models, uh, if, or for example, saturated soil, do these model are these models able to represent cohesion, or do you need to add something to those? What's your opinion on that? So, so cohesion. So all these results that I presented here are cohesionless. Um, Partially saturated there, I'm talking about SPH now. There is work coming out of uh, University of Manchester. Um, I, if somebody pings me, I can I can provide the, the, na the, the, the name of the author um, and the paper, but it's published work, partially saturated and fully saturated soils. That's, that's, that's being worked on right now. Cohesion, we have the way to incorporate it in the solver, we have not validated against anything, and it's not a trivial thing to do. You can you can account for cohesion, but in my in 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 our lab here, we have not validated against anything. So that's that's where it's at. I, I have no idea of the, its predictive attributes of the model when it comes to cohesion. Yes, you can put a parameter there, and the behavior of the terrain changes. But I have not validated against any sort of experimental data to tell you, yep, it makes sense. That's where it's at at this point. Thank you. It's good to, good to know. Now, let me. And, and send me an email for, for those people who are interested in this. Uh, I can, there's a really nice work coming out of the University of Manchester about, about this. And it's very recent, it's 2024. Very good. I would be interested in that. Let me. Check in the chat. I don't think we have questions over there, if I'm right. In the meantime, I guess I can just, um, you know, have kind of carry out the discussion. Um, so, Professor Negrut, so we're talking about cohesionless soils. So, I would just want to know what you would feel, you know, when you're using something continuum based, say like SPH, for example, using that versus DEM. Now I know the computational time is like quite like different for both of them. Um, so I just want to know like, I guess like what 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 are the limitations of one model or you know what what can DEM do better? What can SPH do better? When would you use one versus the other? Um, and, and I guess things like that. And mm -hmm. you know, like I know with DEM, um, you know, many we know that actually it's meant to be um you know you have to you know have the size of the particle to be the same but i know that computationally we can never do that um, and we always make the size of the particle some x number of times uh, what it is so again is there any um i guess implications of doing it um and i know some some people argue that you know the results are not trustworthy because of that and things like that so what are your i guess your opinions on that mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, uh, DEM first. Um, DEM, the, the reason I would use DEM is when the particle size is crazy. And this idea of homogenization that under, 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 under basically is the anchors the CRM is, is questionable. Um, CRM is, is faster because you have definitely fewer degrees of freedom. And if you get away with that, if you can get away with that, uh, that's, that's great. If you have particles 
of identical shape and non basically simple relatively simple shape then crm is going to be good at least that's what we see in simulation if you start having like uh, very odd shapes and complex geometries then and 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 very you have a spectrum of dimensions so it's not like all the particles are more or less identically you know basically shaped identically uh but if you have like different shapes and different sizes then crm is not going to to cut it and then you have to go to to dm now with dm one thing that i didn't show here but we did this um we looked at how the size of the particle influences the term mechanics and at some point it doesn't make a whole lot of a difference if you just keep going lower and lower and lower sizes and i i have that slide i don't i, I didn't include it here but there is certainly you cannot have like uh, big pebbles and claim that that's how powder is going to behave but if you are if you're up to running 4200 simulations probably you should spend a week trying to see what is the largest particle size that you can get away with this is exactly what we did so we looked at those those uh, uh slope versus uh, uh slip curves and we started cranking up the particle size and at some point you can see that the results are changing um and at that point you know say so like oh yeah i'm going to stay within the safe safe margin of that and that's going to be the size of the particle that i work with and do i feel good about this and should be like i sure i mean if there was a guy here at wisconsin he actually started the statistics department here even a colleague back in the day, his name was George Box. He passed away, but he said that uh, uh, the model, all the models are wrong, but some are useful. That's exactly how it goes. You, you, you need, you owe it to yourself to understand where your model works and where it doesn't, and just don't use it when it doesn't. Um, and there's no substitute to that. I think you have to do some pre-testing in phase to understand how big of a of a particle size you work with or for CRM or let's say go DM again how, how soft of a particle because if you have like very very high stiffness you're going to that's going to kill your integration time step um and then once you are you are you're running reasonably fast and the results look consistent with the expectations you you start doing the type of study that that I report in this in this presentation it took months and certainly before you jump into something like that you better know that it's worth spending months and months of compute time to to crunch numbers uh, i don't know if i answer your question it was a simple question and i gave you a, a long convoluted answer <laughs> no i think that's a perfect answer honestly that's that was perfect like i'm also from the modeling world so i can definitely get what you're trying to say so yeah that was a perfect answer yeah, yeah. let me add one more thing uh -huh. like these simulations these simulations i i i'm not going to to to, to stand behind uh, the friction force is 34.9937 Newton. I, 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 I cannot. However, I think it is reasonable to believe is that if you have uh, control policy A, control policy B, C, and D, uh -huh. and you test it in simulation, and it consistently, consistently, simulation B comes out on top, then mm -hmm. I would say, as an engineer, I'm going to go with 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 simulation with with solution B because mm -hmm. that that solution is the one that looks better. I, I don't know if the ninth decimal is correct, but <laughs> just like statistically speaking, that's how I go by. I mean, like, what can I do other than just run over and over again, look at like, right. exp de experimental data, correlate with that. If it's predictive, I trust that my simulators qualitatively are going to. Uh, indicate a, a solution that is superior to a different one and that's that's where it's where it's at um you gain insights and you make calls and that's how i see simulation being used yeah thank you for answering that <laughs> sure, sure thing any any other questions anyone
think we will be we will be very very happy to give people space to talk if if the chat doesn't work that well. Uh, but uh, it may be that the phrase if all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, that's a very good uh, way to to conclude the presentation and and uh, and this this work. Well, again, thanks everybody for taking the time. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, if you want to reach out. I would be super happy to, to 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 get back with you with further information. And thanks for hosting me here, Varsha and Bogimir. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We have a few slides, but don't go, everybody don't go, don't go uh, away yet. That Varsha is going to show you some information about ISTVs that might be useful for you. Okay, we have the slides up. So if you are interested in, uh, uh, so uh, if you are interested in uh, Terra Mechanics research and you want to be part of this community, we invite you to join ISTVS. You will be most welcome, and there is a link for you to sign up. <coughs> also, we have an upcoming conference in Yokohama, Yokohama Japan, at the end of October, and we, I need to make sure that you know that ISTV talks are recorded and posted on ISTV's YouTube channel. This one should be posted today. We already covered many interesting topics, and you can find them all on YouTube. Now, the next ISTVS digital event, it will be a talk about Mississippi State University Autonomous Vehicle Simulator, MAVS, given by Dr. Christopher Goodin on May 22nd. Christopher is my colleague and the lead developer of the MAVS. MAVS is freely available for academic and non-commercial non use. It is a very well-documented tool that is used in the classroom by graduate students and by researchers all around the world. So we are looking forward very much to seeing you at our next talk. So I guess that's it for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Professor Negrut, for this amazing presentation. Really love the insights. I think it was really helpful to see um, I was really interested in your design parameterization and all the sensitivities with respect to design. Because I, as I guess, I, I guess a modeler, sometimes people ask, oh, what's the use of this? What's the use of this? And I guess you really show that really simply, um, what modeling can do and what exactly is the power of modeling. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Dr. Bovemir, for um, having this session, for hosting it. Um, I guess it's a really good combination. I just want to say thank you for everybody for attending. Um, please check out our website, and I guess we're going to be done for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Varsha. Thanks. Thanks, Bogumir. <laughs>